Previously, we focused on pyruvate decarboxylation. So what we basically said is, once glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm and we form the pyruvate molecules under aerobic conditions when we have plenty of oxygen in the cell, the pyruvate molecules will then move into the matrix of the mitochondrion. And once inside the matrix, before the pyruvate molecules can actually enter the citric acid cycle, they must be activated. And the way that we activate the pyruvate molecule is by removing a carbon dioxide and taking the remaining two carbon components of the pyruvate known as the acetyl group and placing it onto a carrier molecule known as coenzyme A-CoA. So at the end of pyruvate decarboxylation that takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria, we form the acetyl coenzyme A complex. Now, this activates the molecule and allows it to actually enter the citric acid cycle. So we see that pyruvate decarboxylation actually is the connection, it's the link between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle of aerobic cell respiration. So pyruvate decarboxylation connects or links glycolysis to aerobic cell respiration by creating the acetyl coenzyme A molecule that can readily enter the first step of the citric acid cycle. And so in this lecture, I'd like to begin our discussion on the first step of the citric acid cycle. So what exactly is the first step? Well, once we form the acetyl coenzyme A complex, it goes into the citric acid cycle and undergoes step one. And in step one, the ultimate goal is to combine the acetyl group of the acetyl coenzyme A, the two carbon component, onto a four carbon component, a four carbon molecule found in the matrix of the mitochondrion known as oxaloacetate. And this is the same oxaloacetate that we saw when we discussed gluconeogenesis. So the four carbon molecule oxaloacetate is ultimately combined with this two carbon component, the acetyl group of acetyl coenzyme A to form a six carbon molecule, one, two, three, four, five, six, known as citrate. Now citrate is the conjugate base of citric acid. And citric acid is an example of a tricarboxylic acid, and that's why the citric acid cycle is also sometimes known as the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle. And of course, we also regenerate the coenzyme A, and the coenzyme A can now be reused in the process of pyruvate decarboxylation. Now, as we can see from the following overall reaction, step one of the citric acid cycle is actually a multi-step process. It consists of two different steps. And both of these steps are essentially catalyzed by an enzyme known as citrate synthase. And as the name applies, as the name implies, we essentially synthesize the citrate molecule beginning with these two reactant molecules. So these are the substrate molecules to the citrate synthase. Now, step number one is actually an aldol condensation, and we'll look at the details of this step in just a moment. And in step one, we form a citral coenzyme A. Now, the citral coenzyme A is actually very high in energy. Why? Well, because of this thioester bond that connects the carbon and the sulfur. So this is a very high energy bond. And in step two, once we undergo the condensation reaction, we'll undergo a hydrolysis reaction in which a water molecule will, will be used in the enzyme's active site to actually cleave the high energy bond forming these two products, the citrate molecule and the coenzyme A. And this step essentially releases energy, and this is the step that drives this entire step one of the citric acid cycle. So once again, the first step produces a citral coenzyme A complex, which contains the six carbon component attached onto the coenzyme A. This reaction is what we call an aldol condensation.
The second step releases the coenzyme A component to form the citrate molecule as well as this individual coenzyme A. And this is a hydrolysis reaction in which we use the water to actually cleave this bond. And so the oxygen essentially attaches itself onto this carbon here to form this group shown here. Now, it's the second step of this overall process that drives the overall equilibrium of this process to the product side so that we can basically form these citrate molecules effectively and efficiently. And that's because the cleavage of this high energy bond is actually a very beneficial process because we don't want to have this high thioester bond, this, uh, this high in energy thioester bond. So in this lecture, I'd like to focus on step one, or actually the first process of step one. So the aldol condensation reaction, because this step is much more complicated than the simple hydrolysis step. So before we look at the reaction mechanism, what actually takes place in the active side of the enzyme, let's discuss briefly this citrate synthase enzyme. So citrate synthase, the enzyme that catalyzes step one of the citric acid cycle, is actually a dimer enzyme, it consists of two identical subunits. And one of these subunits is shown on the board. Basically, we have two of these subunits that essentially interact with one another to form the citrate synthase. Now, let's take a look at this subunit. And actually, the subunit contains three types of domains, or actually two types of domains, but overall three domains. So we have one domain here, then we have an intermediate domain and another domain here. And these domains are essentially identical, but they're different to this middle domain. And we see that we have active sites found right over here, right next to this domain and here right next to this domain. And interestingly, what happens is these two molecules don't actually bind to the active site together. It's the oxaloacetate that binds into the active site of that enzyme. Why? Well, because initially, in its open conformation, the enzyme, the citrate synthase, only contains an active pocket, an active site for the binding of oxaloacetate. It does not yet contain a pocket that can bind the cetyl coenzyme A. So what we see happening first is the oxaloacetate molecule, the four carbon molecule shown here, binds into the active site. And once it binds into the active site, it creates conformational changes. So it causes these two domains to basically rotate inward, so going this way. And when that rotation takes place, it does several important things. Number one is it seals off the active site. Well, it doesn't actually seal off the active site entirely. Why? Well, because the, this molecule has to enter that particular active site. And we'll see that in this step, as we'll see in just a moment, this actually creates that entire sealing process where we seal off that active site completely. So we go from the open conformation to the closed conformation. And what this also does is upon the binding of the oxaloacetate to the active site of the citrate synthase, it creates an additional binding site in that active site that can now bind the cetyl coenzyme A. So we see that once the oxaloacetate binds to the active site, it creates conformational changes that induces the opening of a binding site, the creation of a binding site that can bind the cetyl coenzyme A. And what it also does is it basically shifts the catalytic residues in the active site in their proper orientation, which can basically begin this aldol condensation step. <coughs> so once again, the enzyme first binds the oxaloacetate into the active site, which causes 
the conformational changes in the structure as shown here, we essentially go from an open conformation to a closed conformation, but it's not entirely closed because we still have to be able to fit the cetyl coenzyme A so that they actually can interact with one another to form the citral coenzyme A. And once the citral coenzyme A is formed, as we'll see in just a moment, only then do we have a complete closure of these active sites. So once this conformational change takes place, it also creates a binding site for acetyl coenzyme A and shifts the catalytic residues in the active side of the enzyme into their proper orientation and position so that the catalysis reaction can actually take place. So to summarize how this process of aldol condensation, basically the first process of step one of the citric acid cycle actually takes place, let's take a look at three at these three diagrams beginning with diagram number one. Now in diagram number one, we have the active side of our enzyme. And there are three different types of residues that basically catalyze this process. We have histidine 274, we have histidine 320, and we also have aspartate 375. Now this here is basically the cetyl coenzyme A, and this here is the oxaloacetate. So let's suppose the oxaloacetate binds into the active side that induces a conformational change that then allows that acetyl coenzyme A to bind into the active side. And so now we have this diagram. So in step one, what takes place is we ultimately want to form an enol intermediate. And remember, the enol form of this molecule contains a hydroxyl group here and a double bond between this carbon and this carbon. So remember from organic chemistry that whenever we have an aldol condensation reaction, we essentially have an enol intermediate molecule. And so to essentially stimulate the formation of this enol molecule that will act as a nucleophile that will help form the citral coenzyme A, we see that these enzymes, or I should say these catalytic residues of the enzyme actually help with this process. So histidine 274 uses the hydrogen ion attached onto this nitrogen it donates that h ion onto the oxygen of this carbonyl group shown here and what that does is it weakens this double bond between the carbon and the oxygen at the same time aspartate 375 basically acts as a base and it takes away the H ion from the methyl group shown here. And by taking away the H ion, it allows this sigma bond to basically go on and form a pi bond, displacing these two electrons, allowing those two electrons to take that H ion. And so we see that these two catalytic residues essentially allow the formation of the enol intermediate, the double bond that will act as a nucleophile in the next step as we'll see in just a moment. So in one, we have histidine 274 shown here in the active side is used to give the carbonyl oxygen that H plus ion. And this stimulates the removal of a hydrogen ion from the methyl group by aspartate 375. So together, these residues act on this acetyl coenzyme A and allows the formation of that enol intermediate molecule that now contains that pi bond between these two carbons of the acetyl group. Now, let's move on to four and five. So now, before this enol intermediate can actually act as a nucleophile, we have to convert this oxaloacetate into a good electrophile. Because remember, anytime we have a nucleophilic attack, we have an electrophile that is actually being attacked. Now, in this form here, the oxaloacetate is not a good enough electrophile. And so what happens is, now we have histidine 320 that donates its H ion onto this oxygen of the carbonyl group of the oxaloacetate. And this, and this basically weakens the pi bond. It forms a carbocation intermediate, and that converts this poor electrophile into 
a much better electrophile. And so now, because this is a very good electrophile, this pi bond of this enol can act as a nucleophile and attack the carbon nucleophilically to form that connection between this, uh, this acetyl group and this citrate molecule. And so in the next step, we are able to actually form that citral coenzyme A. And once we form the citral coenzyme A, that induces even more conformational changes that completely seal off these active sites. And by sealing off the active site, that basically prevents different types of competing reactions from actually taking place. So we see that in part four, the H plus ion of histidine 320 is given to the carbonyl group of the oxaloacetate, creating the strong, the good electrophile. Next, the pi bond of the enol can act as a nucleophile, tagging the carbon of this oxaloacetate, forming that intermediate, that citral coenzyme A. And once the citral coenzyme A is actually formed, that induces even more conformational change that essentially closes, uh, closes off and seals off the active sites of the enzyme completely. And so now we have this microenvironment within the active site of the enzyme that basically means the two, the all, all different types of substrate molecules are found in close proximity and they're found in the proper orientation and that means this reaction basically can continue onwards and so once we form this citrate once we form the citral coenzyme a intermediate the